Greetings, this is Greg. It's not too often I feel the need to make a response to a video on another channel, but this time there's no good way around it. Mark Felton Productions, which I'll call MFP, is a huge channel, and they have a video claiming that the Avro Lancaster was strongly considered for use in the atomic bombings of Japan, and the reasons the B-29s were used instead were largely political. He claims that the reason the B-29 was ultimately used in this role instead of the Lancaster is, quote, not because the RAF could not have pulled off the attacks, but because national prestige won the day, unquote. He's talking about U.S. national prestige there. The MFP video also claims that the Lancaster fulfilled some sort of backup role in case the B-29s didn't work out. He said that if the B-29s set up for the atomic bombs had run into serious problems or delays, that, quote, the backup plan was already thought out and the planes and crews were ready to do what needed to be done. And that would have meant the deployment of the Black Lancasters from Tinian on the 6th of August, 1945, unquote. Please note, he isn't saying that with some sort of long odds Hail Mary pass, it may have been possible to use the Lancaster. He's saying that it almost happened. Not only that, he's saying that Lancasters were the backup plan and that that plan was in place and that Lancasters would have been ready or were ready to fly the atomic missions from Tinian on the date of the Enola Gaze flight. This is pure nonsense, all of it. It wasn't U.S. pride that resulted in the selection of the B-29. It was necessity. The Lancaster could not have done the job, not even close, and I'll go through the reasons it couldn't. But I do want to start with the shreds of truth that are in the video. First of all, yes, the Lancaster was considered for this role. However, just because something is considered or discussed doesn't mean it went anywhere close to becoming reality. Have you heard of the HMS Habakkuk? That was the design for a British aircraft carrier made of ice. It was going to have a maximum capacity of something like 200 airplanes. It was a big thing. This was discussed. It was very seriously considered. They actually built a 1,000 ton model of it, 1,000 tons. So this idea went a lot farther than just an idea or a discussion, but it still never happened. The use of a Lancaster as an atomic bomber never went anywhere near that far. It was never more than an idea. That said, it was an idea. Now, when Dr. Norman Ramsey joined the Manhattan Project in 1943, his first assignment was to look into what type of airplane they would need to deliver the bomb. He concluded that the Lancaster was an option. Now, his conclusions have been blown completely out of proportion by various writers on the subject and YouTube content creators. They often make it sound like Ramsey was a champion of the Lancaster and was convinced it was the answer. So let's open up the U.S. Air Force's history of atomic energy, 1943 to 1953. Among other things, this document details the development of the silver plate B-29s, which were used to deliver the bomb. I've put this up in the Patreon section in case you want to read more of this document. In this entire five-volume set, the Lancaster is mentioned only once, so let's take a look and see what it says. It's clear that Ramsey considered the Lancaster, but it's also clear that he himself decided that the B-29 was the better choice, and there's no indication at all that his choice was political. Now, the other source people often list to suggest that the Lancaster was being seriously considered is General Groves. General Groves was literally the head of the Manhattan Project, and he did mention the Lancaster. We're going to get to that. Here is the organizational chart for the Manhattan Project, and you can clearly see who is at the top. Now, General Groves wrote a book on the subject of the Manhattan Project. In that book, he talks about the idea of using the Lancaster to deliver the atomic bomb. Guess how many times he mentions the Lancaster in his 488-page book? Only once, and here is that page. It's clear he was describing, well, he was addressing a hypothetical question when suggesting using the Lancaster. That question being, what plane to use if the B-29 couldn't be modified to do it? And General Groves makes it clear that he, neither he nor Hap Arnold wanted to use a British airplane, not purely for political reasons, but for practical ones. 
It's also worth noting that on this page, he points out that the bombs themselves changed a bit, making them easier to fit into the B-29s. We're going to come back to that later. This statement from General Groves has been taken out of context and spun to make it look like the Lancaster was somehow being seriously considered. It just wasn't. What about Hap Arnold? Well, I've never found a shred of evidence he was considering the Lancaster for nuclear attacks. In fact, as we'll see later, he seemed to be very much against using Lancasters in the Pacific at all. When preparing for this video, I pulled out all my Lancaster books to make sure there's not something I'm missing, and I wanted to see what else I could find on this subject. Now, this book makes no mention of the Lancaster as a nuclear bomber. Neither does this one. Alfred Price doesn't even mention it. I'm assuming some of you know Alfred Price's books. He really likes British airplanes. The only Lancaster book I have that touches on this subject is this one. And this is a pretty good book, by the way. But you can tell by the title that the author is a really big fan of the Lancaster. And he does mention the idea of using it for the atomic bombing raid. So let's take a look inside. This page tells the story of the young physicist I mentioned earlier, who suggested using the Lancaster, and we already know how far that idea went once presented to General Groves and Hap Arnold. Notice this statement. After work started to make the B-29 suitable, the question of using the Lancaster never arose again. Considering that was in November of 1943, and assuming this book is accurate, that seems to put a huge dent in the idea that there was this secret squadron of Lancasters standing by to drop atomic bombs on Japan. In short, literally everything I can find on this subject shows that while the idea of using a Lancaster in this role was mentioned, and probably considered, it was essentially dead on arrival and never went anywhere. I think we can consider General Grove's book a pretty authoritative source on this. Even the most fanboy Lan Lancaster author out there says the idea was dead by November of 1944. So that really should be the end of this video, but I feel the need to just beat this nonsense to death, so I'm going to keep going. Let's just say that General Groves and Hap Arnold did want to use the Lancaster. Could it have happened? No, absolutely not, for several reasons, and each one is a total deal breaker. First of all, range. The Lancaster did not have the range to fly missions from Tinian. What about using a closer base like Okinawa? First of all, I'll quote again what is said in the MFP video, just to make it very clear what I'm addressing. Quote, the backup plan was already thought out and the planes and crews were ready to do what needed to be done and that would have meant the deployment of the Black Lancasters from Tinian on the 6th of August, 1945, unquote. He is specifically saying from Tinian, not Okinawa or some closer island. Okinawa was out of the question anyway because it was in range of possible Japanese attacks and there was no way the U.S. was going to risk putting a nuclear bomb on an island that was not 100% secure. The mission had to be flown from Tinian. So, how does MFP address this range issue? Well, he does it by claiming that the Lancasters could have used air-to-air -air refueling. Specifically, he claims that two Lancaster tankers had completed successful tests in 1944, but he doesn't give any details or sources. While he doesn't say it specifically, he is saying through implication that Lancaster tankers could refuel Lancaster bombers operationally in World War II. Otherwise, the Lancaster tankers are totally irrelevant to his video. Now, there had been pre-war cases of successful air-to-air -air refueling instances. One British company called Flight Refueling Limited worked on the issue. In fact, I would say they were the leaders in the field at the time. This company is still around today, and they have a website. Here is their history page. Now, you would think that if they had worked out successful aerial refueling of Lancasters during the war, they might mention it, but they don't. Is there any evidence of the RAF operationally refueling a Lancaster in flight? I can't find any. It was tried, but every source I have on this shows it was unsuccessful. In Peter March's book, he says that they tried aerial refueling, but he makes it clear that it didn't work out during the war. That's not to say that maybe there was some very limited success, maybe a single plane refueled uh, out of many failures, 
but clearly it was never reliable enough to actually use for a mission, let alone for such a critical mission. In this issue of Popular Science, they talk about aerial refueling. At this point, it had been done successfully, but this was in 1947. I see no evidence that any Lancaster was ever successfully refueled in the air during World War II. Maybe there's some secondary claim that it happened once, but if it happened enough to be reliable, we would see evidence of that, and we would have seen it before 1947, and we just don't. And MFP certainly doesn't present any in his video. Let's keep going. So let's just say that the USAAF leadership wanted to use the Lancaster, and that the British had perfected aerial refueling of them by mid-1945, and for some reason then kept that a secret until Mark Felton uncovered it. MFP acknowledges the serious problem with the Lancaster's chances of surviving a nuclear blast. I don't think we have any way to quantify this for sure, quantify the odds, that is. I do think it's a really big problem, but because I don't have any way to nail this down, and because I want to keep going, I'll just say that in this case, the Lancaster either survives the blast, or if it doesn't, I'll just assume that it's been decided to use a sacrificial crew, perhaps volunteers that have terminal illnesses or something like that. I want to be clear that I think it's very unlikely that that would have happened. In my opinion, in order to maximize the effect of nuclear weapons as a post-war deterrent, it was important that the atomic missions go off without any sacrifices or complications. So I doubt they would have wanted to sacrifice a crew or even the plane that flew the mission. In fact, in the report I mentioned earlier, they talk about this sort of thing specifically. They knew the war was won before dropping the bomb. Now, if and when the Japanese would surrender was still a big question, but it was understood that the Japanese military's offensive capability was wiped out. So, a lot of the discussion about dropping the bomb had a lot to do with how this was going to look on the world stage, and they wanted it to look good. Sacrificing a crew wouldn't have been a good look. What about the uh, Lancaster even reaching Japan? In other words, could the Japanese shoot it down? Even in August of 1945, the Japanese could still shoot down bombers, and a Lancaster would be an easy target. Relative to the B-29, the Lancaster was a slow and low-flying airplane, easy prey for the few remaining Japanese fighters, and the Japanese still had some pretty decent anti-aircraft gunnery. It couldn't really reach the high-flying B-29s, but it could definitely reach a Lancaster. The Lancaster's survival rate over in Europe, such as it was, had a lot more to do with how the plane was used rather than the attributes of the plane itself. It tended to operate in Europe either at night or in areas where there was minimal chance of encountering enemy fighters. The Lancaster had minimal armor, almost none, and with no lower turret, enemy fighters could easily exploit its soft underbelly. Hiding at night wasn't an option. The atomic bombs had to be dropped in visual conditions. Both General Grove's book and Colonel Paul Tibbetts' book mention this repeatedly, Paul Tibbetts, of course, being uh, the commander of the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Now, the crews of the B-29s assigned to Tibbet's squadron were trained to drop the bomb via radar aiming, but it's very clear that when it came time to drop the bomb, it was visual conditions only. In fact, in Tibbet's book, he makes it clear that if they couldn't see the target, they were instructed to return to Tinian with the bomb, after it was disarmed, of course. More on that later. Could a Lancaster have reached Hiroshima in conditions suitable for visual bombing, meaning daylight and good weather? Maybe, but considering the cost and scarcity of the atomic bombs, would you take that chance? Probably not. There were only three of these bombs in existence. The British did work up a plan to use Lancasters for conventional bombing of Japan. It never happened. But the anticipated loss rates are interesting, and they were incredibly high. You might want to pause and read this page from McKinstry's book. And keep in mind, this guy's a big fan of the Lancaster, and his over 600-page book is remarkable and well-researched. If you're listening to this on audio only, the British were anticipating loss rates as high as 80 to 85 percent when using Lancasters against Japan. There is just no way 
the U.S. was going to risk an atomic bomb with those odds. Okay, so this entire idea should be dead by now. The use of a Lancaster for this mission was never seriously considered by anyone in the position to make it happen. It didn't have the range, didn't have air-to-air -air refueling until well after the war, and didn't have good odds of even getting to the target. But there's an even bigger problem, and that's arming the bomb. Let's talk about the Lancaster's famously cavernous bomb bay for a moment. It is big, but in terms of square footage, it's not that much bigger than any other heavy bomber. It's just really long. For example, the maximum payload of a normal Lancaster, not one modified, but a normal one, was about 14,000 pounds. For a B-17F or a G model, the maximum internal bomb load was 12,800 pounds. So not as much less than the Lancaster as most people think, 14,000 versus 12,800. Here's the loadout chart for a B-17F. Notice there's a configuration with eight 1,600 pounders, four on each side. However, the Lancaster's bomb bay not only had a little more capacity, it was long and uninterrupted, which lent itself to being easily modified to carry really large bombs or generally unusual payloads. But there was a big downside, actually several, but we're only concerned about one of those right now. In a Lancaster, the bombardier cannot access the bomb bay in flight. During World War II, conventional bombs were armed by a spinning, tiny little propeller, which the British called an arming vane. It was sometimes located at the front of the bomb, sometimes at the back of the bomb. On the ground, there would be a pin in the vane preventing it from spinning. You can see the pin on this bomb on the nose at about the 7 o'clock position. The armorer standing there is about to pull the pin. Now the pin is pulled, and when that bomb falls, that uh, vein is going to spin up and the bomb's going to arm itself. So far, so good, right? It's not armed when it's on the ground, and if the plane crashes on takeoff, it's probably not going to explode. But what if the crew has to dump the bomb load shortly after takeoff? Well, if you care about your civilian population, then that's a problem. The American heavy bombers went with a different method. They had bomb bays which were accessible to the bombardier, and the bombardier would pull those pins out himself sometime after takeoff. Now, obviously for external payloads, they couldn't do that, and some planes were too small to have accessible bomb bays, but the bigger U.S. bombers did. Here is the bombardier's checklist for a B-17. If the bombs are not accessible in flight, and that means external bombs, which were not normally unused, not normally used on B-17s, but B-17s did have hard points on them, and if they were using those, then those pins had to be pulled before takeoff. For bombs that were accessible in flight, meaning in the bomb bay, and this is what would normally happen, the bombardier would pull the pins prior to reaching the IP. IP is the initial point. It is typically about 40 miles or so before the target. So at some point before that point, the IP, the bombardier, goes back there and pulls those pins. That way, if the American plane has to drop bombs in friendly territory, at least they won't explode. So the American bombers had bomb bays with enough room in them for a man to pass through and arm the bombs, and that's part of the reason they generally had a little bit less capacity. Side note, in the B-17... The bombardiers would normally remove those pins and throw them into the radio operator's compartment. I know this because at the War Eagles Museum in New Mexico, I met a B-17 radio operator, and this was probably 12 to 15 years ago. Uh, he was working there, as a, I think, as a volunteer at the time. And this gentleman flew a lot of missions in B-17s during the war, and he kept every one of those pins because the bombardier was throwing them into his compartment, and he just thought it'd be a cool thing to hold on to, because each one had a specific mission tag on it. And all of these tags, all of them, were on display at that museum. I don't know if they're still there, but it was really cool to see them and hear his stories about all the missions associated with those tags. I wish I could tell you the man's name. Um, moving on. In the case of the atomic bombs, it wasn't just a case of pulling a pin to arm it. There was a long involved procedure to arm or disarm the bomb with tools involved. So making some sort of access panel in the, in the uh, floor of the plane or something just wasn't going to work. The person arming the bomb had to have really good access to it. Furthermore, 
If the target was obscured by weather or smoke or whatever, the plane would have to return to Tinian with the bomb on board. Thus, the bombardier would have to disarm the bomb. Now, there is no way the U.S. was going to have a plane take off from a base with an armed atomic bomb on board. Keep in mind that at the time of the Enola Gaze mission to New Hiroshima, there were four burned-out wreckages of B-29s on the field that had crashed on takeoff. It was not uncommon for overloaded bombers back then to crash on takeoff. So taking that risk with an armed atomic bomb would have just been beyond crazy. This is a total deal breaker for the Lancaster as an atomic bomber. Not only in World War II, but any time after. It was never used as one and never seriously considered for such use. So I think that ends that part of the discussion. But while I'm here, I want to address some of the other nonsense in the MFP video. Was there really a secret squadron of black Lancasters which were trained to drop the atomic bomb? Clearly, if there was, the Americans were never going to let them fly the mission anyway. The stakes were too high to risk it with such low odds of success. But on the other hand, let's just say that maybe the British had this backup plan on their own uh, as their own sort of secret contingency. Well, let's see if that idea passes the reasonableness test. Britain's military and economy were stretched to the maximum during World War II. As with any nation, their resources were somewhat limited and they had a lot on their plate. This was part of the reason they halted any serious work on their own of the atomic bomb and handed what data they had over to the Americans. They also pulled back from the Pacific very early in the war, retreating to the western side of the Indian Ocean. And they didn't return to the Pacific in force until the war in Europe was nearing completion. And it's clear that they had a very full plate. Does it make sense that during these conditions they would dedicate an entire squadron of expensive aircraft and highly trained personnel to a fantasy project that had virtually no chance of ever being used, and then keep that squadron trained and on standby from the time of its inception until the end of the war? I find this very unlikely. MFP claims that this secret squadron used unmarked black Lancasters and was kept isolated from other RAF personnel on the base and that their planes were modified uh, with the removal of the bomb bay doors. First of all, he's so non-specific here it's hard to pin anything down. There were a lot of secret operations with Lancasters that involved altering the bomb bay doors or removing them. That alone isn't anything unusual, and we saw the results of those projects in various special missions and, uh, that the planes flew in the European theater. What evidence is there that this secret squadron, if it existed at all, had anything to do with delivery of an atomic bomb? He doesn't present any. If you were trying to preserve secrecy, does it make sense that you would paint the planes in a special paint scheme? Why would you do that? Wouldn't you want them to blend in and not attract any extra attention from the personnel on or around the base who might be uh, might chance and see them? He seems to be implying that these secret Lancasters were all black. The normal RAF Lancaster paint scheme was already designed to minimize visibility at night. They were already black on the underside. I don't know why you would want to paint one all black. Or maybe he just means the black Lancasters were in the normal paint scheme with the black underside, but if that's the case, then why call them black Lancasters? Furthermore, if you were setting up a plane to operate in close proximity to a nuclear blast, would you paint it all black? I'll let the physics experts in the comments section handle that one, but it seems to me that black paint would literally be the worst choice for this. Are there any records of Lancasters or Lancaster crews training for atomic missions? MFP provides us with nothing here. He just expects you to understand that it was such a big secret that there are no records and you just need to take his word for it. I have to call BS on that. Would there have been secrecy? Sure. The Manhattan Project was highly classified. It's said that Harry Truman, the U.S. Vice President, didn't even know about it until Roosevelt died. That's somewhat correct. When Truman was vice president, he did know that something was going on because he was very closely involved in budgetary issues, and he knew a lot of money was going for some very large project, um, but he didn't know exactly what it was. Churchill did know, as well as some others, but 
Overall, the Manhattan Project was a very well-kept secret. There are a lot of details about the B-29 crews training for the atomic missions, a lot of details and, and source data for that. They used sort of a nuclear bomb simulator called the Pumpkin. This is one here. It simulated the Fat Man bomb. And we even know how many times it was dropped, how many were made, and which B-29s and crews dropped it. It was all secret at the time, but of course all this stuff is out now. Um, this is one of the bombers involved named Straight Flush. There were many others. Some of the bombers in this squadron had incredibly prophetic names. I find that really interesting. Uh, one of them was called Up and Adam. Adam being spelled A-T-O-M. One was called Strange Cargo. Another was named Necessary Evil. Of course, the most famous ones are the ones that actually dropped the real atomic bombs, which were, of course, Enola Gay and Boxcar. All in all, there were at least 13 B-29s and crews that trained with those pumpkins, and they dropped them about 49 or 50 times. Side note, Enola Gay and Boxcar, and most of the other B-29s in the 509th Composite Squadron, were built by Martin, not Boeing. Most people don't know that. Oh, and the 509th, the squadron um, which had Enola Gay and Boxcar, was called a composite squadron because it contained transport aircraft as well as bombers. That designation has nothing to do with the types of weapons it would deliver. Now, I haven't found a shred of evidence that Lancasters ever carried a pumpkin bomb or did any specific training for atomic missions. It, it wasn't just dropping the bombs they had to train for. The B-29 crews spent a lot of time working out and, and practicing the maneuver used to escape the bomb shockwave, which I suspect would have destroyed a Lancaster. Is there any evidence anywhere of Lancaster crews training uh, in this sort of maneuver for this purpose? We have tons of evidence showing the B-29 crews from the 509th doing it. I think the secret black Lancasters and crews that train for atomic missions are just pure fantasy. There's no credible evidence for this. But then MFP blurs the story of the secret Black Lancasters by sort of mixing it in with Tiger Force. He said, quote, While the B-29 struggled through testing in America, the British had committed a large force of Lancasters to begin a concerted aerial assault on Japan, flying from bases in Burma, unquote. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about Tiger Force for a moment. This was more of an idea than an actual force, and it certainly never went into battle against Japan. Tiger Force stemmed from the Second Quebec Conference, which was the conference in which the U.S. and British planned out the defeat of Japan. Take a look at this document. Go to Note 25. This is a U.S. document from the conference and says in part, We have agreed that the British fleet should participate in the main operations against Japan in the Pacific. The key word here is agreed. The U.S. was for this and it did happen. As I've discussed in previous videos, the British Pacific Fleet's contribution to the war in the Pacific was considerable and the U.S. was fortunate to have them there. But now look at note 26. Do they use the word agreed? Heck no. I'm paraphrasing here, but it says, give us an estimate of what you think the RAF can do and we'll take a look at it. The truth is, Hap Arnold had no interest in having the British bomb Japan. Here is a section of the Hap Arnold diary that touches on this. While the British seemed to want to bomb Japan for some reason, it's clear that Hap Arnold and the Joy Chiefs didn't think it was a good idea. We also know what the British were proposing, at least in general terms, which you can see here. But we see again in this document that Hap Arnold was against it. And ultimately, it really was his call because he controlled the islands from which the Lancasters would have to operate to have any reasonable chance of success at all. So what about Tiger Force? Well, it was essentially a reorganizing plan. The British took squadrons from Europe and assigned them on paper to Tiger Force. But they never actually went to Asia during the war, and just getting them there was going to be a huge undertaking. Avro, who manufactured the Lancaster, and by the way, the Lancaster is a good airplane. I'm not trying to be down on the Lancaster. I'm just trying to put an end to this nonsense about it, it being an alternate for the uh, atomic attacks. Anyway, Avro prepared a tropicalized version of the Lancaster to get it ready for service in Tiger Force. Here's a statement about this from BAE. Notice they felt the need to paint the upper surfaces white to reduce 
internal temperatures. I wonder why that might be, and uh, maybe some of our physics uh, friends can talk about that in the comments. Now, if you look up the history of individual squadrons, and you can easily do that with stuff from the Royal Air Force during World War II, you can see that many squadrons were assigned to Tiger Force, a whole lot of them, um, as was the case here with the famous 617 Squadron. You may have heard of that one. However, most of these squadrons were disbanded before they ever got to Asia, and the very few that did ended up in India in 1946. The Lancaster story has a little bit about Tiger Force, including this great picture of the white scheme for the tropical version. Of course, as it says on this page, the Japanese surrender prevented them from going. Another page in the book shows that they were not even scheduled to go until November of 1945. Not even scheduled. We know Hap Arnold didn't want them on Okinawa, so I'm not sure what would have happened even then. These dates put a huge dent in MFP's claims of Lancasters being ready to fly missions off of Tinian. They didn't even have a Lancaster that could do conventional bombing anywhere in the Pacific at that point, and didn't even plan on having one there until November, and even that plan was very unlikely to ever happen. Before I end this video, I think I need to touch on MFP's claims about the Silver Plate B-29, which was the variant set up to deliver the nuclear bombs. Yes, there were some bumps in the road during development, just as with nearly every World War II airplane. Expecting everything to go swimmingly all the time is indicative of a person that has never worked on any technical project of any significance. There was an incident when a B-29 was damaged due to the failure of the release mechanism for the bomb during development. However, this was not an actual production silver plate. It was a standard B-29 that was being modified as a test bed. Furthermore, the bomb it was carrying was a mock-up of an early version of the atomic bomb called Thin Man. Thin Man was 17 feet long, and the design was abandoned in favor of Little Boy and Fat Man. So this single incident involved a prototype airplane and a prototype bomb that was never actually built. But this whole thing has been blown completely out of proportion. The Thin Man bomb was also the bomb that, called Dr. Nor that caused Dr. Norman Ramsey to suggest using the Lancaster in the first place. And again, that bomb was never even built. And if it was, it wouldn't have mattered because the Lancaster was never going to carry it anyway. MFP talks about the Silver Plate B-29 as if it's something that just barely worked out and barely in time, but that's simply false. They had fully operational silver plates and were training in them by late 1944. Enola Gay was delivered to the U.S. Army Air Force in May of 1945, way before the atomic bombings in August. Boxcar was delivered even earlier in March of 1945. When the 509th Composite Group flew their atomic missions against Japan, they had 29 silver plate B-29s, and only three atomic bombs were available, so this wasn't a close thing. The planes were ready way before the bombs, and to suggest otherwise is an incredible disservice to the YouTube community and to history in general. The silver plates performed well. It's not often mentioned, but there were 15 silver plates involved in the two atomic bombing raids. Enola Gay herself flew on both the Hiroshima mission as a bomber, and then again on the Nagasaki, Nagasaki mission as a weather observer. In fact, her crew found that Boxcar's primary target was obscured, which then resulted in the attack on Nagasaki. The point here is, that all 15 silver plates involved in these missions performed well, and there were plenty of them available. I want to thank my Patreon supporters. They make this channel possible. I don't have sponsors, and I'm not pandering for views or organizing my channel in such a way that it hits the algorithm just right, like a lot of the bigger channels do. Um, without the support of these relatively few people, videos like this one wouldn't happen. On that subject, I'm updating the Patreon section with the B-17 manual, people have been asking for that, and of course the Air Force's reports on the early days of atomic energy, which provides some fascinating reading and offers a great look into, this, into the decision making and political thoughts um, that they were considering in regards to dropping the first atomic bombs. Thanks for everything. Uh, that's all for now. Again, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.